A horse up a gallop, but not just any horse. This one was a three-time Cheltenham Gold Cup winner, and in the process of establishing his preeminence, became one of those rare animals who get under our skin and graduate to being public property. Many promise, but few deliver as best mate did. I don't think I've ever seen him look better and I, I looked and stood on the rails at him I watched him and I thought you know you are just so beautiful you are just perfection in a racehorse perfection in the thoroughbred no wonder you've done so well you know you, you just are best mate the special best mate so how was it that the ebullient brummy Jim Lewis first linked up with the blue-blooded Henrietta to form one of the sports most successful owner trainer partnerships we walked into this coffee shop in Pershaw for a coffee and on the on the magazine rack there was a, a picture uh, sorry a magazine the field which we've still got still got it here and on the front was this picture of Henrietta Knight and the, with a Labrador dog sitting on this haystack so I decided to write to Henrietta didn't we yes. and and I wrote and said I've got this horse by Campbell he's called Pearl Prospect and you know would you like to train him for me and all that stuff and she wrote back and said you will not believe but that horse that you bought at Doncaster sales half of it belonged to me and Henrietta trained our first winner Pearl Prospect when he won at Wincanton yes. As the team got happily soaked in the crush of the Cheltenham winners' enclosure after Best Mate's third Gold Cup, the media, as they do, began to talk of a fourth. But in all honesty, from the start of the 2004 season, the road to Cheltenham proved rocky and uphill, and Best Mate was anything but imperious on his seasonal debut at Exeter, just scraping home by a short nut from the hardy but below top class perennial performer, Seabold. Then, swerving the King George for the second year running, it was off to Leopardstown for the Lexus chase, which he had won in 2003 on an afternoon when the Irish rarely took him to their hearts. But nothing went to plan. I went back to Ireland, that's when everything started to go wrong. I mean, from well, the, re the week building up to that, when the, the weather started to get very bad. And uh, really and truly, it was sort of the downward slope from there, because uh, from that telephone call in the middle of the night from Jackie Jenner from the, from the docks,
to say that Best Mate had had a cut his face in the horse box. Um, and then getting over there and finding the ground to be really very, very testing. It was proper heavy ground. Hen and Jim Colotti agonised over the state of the ground, but the team decision was to go for it. In second place, best mate in third. Barrow Drive just pecked a bit, ruled supreme on the outside and held up I must admit, he just didn't give me the same feel through the race. He just wasn't himself. Um, and we plugged away and I still thought I might win and you know, kind of third last, I was thinking, you know, this is a struggle, like he just wasn't alive under me, like he normally is. Um, you know, then I had, to, I had to get a race and kind of go into the third last, ask him for a big one. He came for me but landed and he, he was normally quick away from his fence, so he just landed and there was just nothing there. And you know, jumped the last two and he plugged up the hill, B for Salmon was gone. Today, as B for Salmon comes home to win the Lexus chase in fine style, racing up to the line, B for Salmon, Paul Carberry stands up and he's calling best mate on as they go by the line. And uh, B for Salmon wins it well, best mate is second. Pizarro was third and Cloudy Bays is fourth. When things go wrong, you've got to have the excuse. And I was kind of scratching my head. I think, well, the ground wasn't ideal, but, you know, he should have coped with it. Um, but anyway, he went away back to the stable yard. He was a tired horse. He then travelled back to England. And he was coughing and he got a snotty nose. And I looked at him when I then flew back to England day or two later I looked at him inside in the box he was standing in the corner huddled up he was very sick so he'd got the virus the travelling the virus probably the bang in the head obviously didn't help everything just went wrong for him it took six long weeks for best mate to come right after his abortive trip to Ireland a nightmare hiatus at the worst time possible during his crucial build up towards the gold cup then just a week before the big race, on a routine morning, Gold Cup number four went out the door. He was back at home schooling that morning. Um, Jackie Jenner rode him in his bit of work, and seemingly he'd only gone five furlongs or something, and burst blood vessel, and he just had blood pouring out of both nostrils. It wasn't a little bleed, it was a proper bleed. Um, so, you know, Hen discussed it with the vet and just called a halt to the whole thing immediately. Cheltenham was off. Henrietta rarely ever telephones me. We always communicate by fax and it's quite an unusual occurrence if she phones me. And in order to put my mind at rest, she'll always say, hello Jim, no problems. So I can then relax and think well, whatever she's going to tell me now is not a problem, you see. So this morning, particular morning, she rang me and said, hello Jim. And I waited and she didn't say, no problems. And she said, the dream is over for this year. And then proceeded to tell me about the burst blood vessel and, and all that stuff, you know. And um, I remember saying to Hen, well, Hen, thank God it happened on the gallops. Because it wouldn't have been right for him if it had happened anywhere else, you know. Not, not while he's with his people, he would, that would that have been quite undignified, you know. But in the summer of 2005, out in his paddock, it was still all to play for. At 10, best mate was hardly any age. His carefully husbanded career had ensured he'd not been to the well too often, and there was no reason to believe that his broken blood vessel should prove any bar to future success. But he would need a new jockey. Jim Colotti, both made by the horse and one of the makers of him, decided the time was right for retirement. The course to Cheltenham would have to be plotted by a new pilot, and so the exceptional Paul Carberry took over the mantle and was in the uh, saddle at Exeter. Some time at the four, they're off and they're racing for this William Hill Holden Gold Cup towards the first of 12 fences and straight into the lead is Ashley Brook at fence number one flies it from see you sometime and best mate is settled in a very handy third by Paul Carberry followed then by Mr McGoldrick and Cato Star in the green and yellow jacket towards the outside tracked the outside as they take the next still Ashley Brook a 
over in front there. Lands about three lengths clear this time from Kato Star. Kadoon has made headway. See you sometime coming under pressure, losing ground. Continuing down the back straight. On towards another plane fence. Ashley Brook continues. I was watching the race. He was jumping great for Paul Carvey. He was travelling great. You know, they were going to right go gallop. He was still travelling within himself. And I thought, this, this will suit him. He'll run well. Um, then he started fizzling out a bit, kind of halfway up the back. And I was thinking well you know, even if he needed to run a bit or anything you know it's too far out he shouldn't be he shouldn't be going already I was with Drew and got up the head I said he's struggling he's got a problem and then we saw him pull up and we ran and uh, Drew got there before me because he's a bit quicker and <laughs> I looked around the screen I said he's dead I walked away and it, it was bad for Paul Carvey too you know but I um, mean, he's a true professional and he's very, very good. I was the first person with the horse when he was obviously stricken. And uh, I saw him go and, uh, you know, it was, it was lovely to see that it was so peaceful and quick and that obviously he knew nothing. And it's really the people who were left behind who were so saddened by it all. As far as the horse is concerned, it was a wonderful ending. Um, but it's just, it's quite amazing, the feeling that has been expressed from everybody else throughout the country and throughout the world, really, at the loss of this horse. I think that um, when one has time to overcome the grieving part, you know, and you look back and, and, and you sort of try and draw consolation from it, don't you? First consolation that was when he died, he died peacefully by just folding his legs on the turf, laying his head down and Jackie Jenner was there with him, so was Henrietta, so was Terry, so was the entire, my entire family, you know, and all his fans. So you can draw consolation from that, that he even died with dignity and, and, and uh, panache, you know. Best mate's death was literally front page news. Here was that rare horse who struck chords beyond the narrow parish of jump racing and was a name in the wider sporting world. The tributes to him were warm and heartfelt, due recognition that here had been a real rarity and that racing had been doubly blessed by the fact he'd been in the hands of three people whose popularity had grown alongside his, Henrietta, Terry and Jim. Winning three gold cups meant inevitable comparisons with Arkell, who did the same. There's no real argument over which horse was the greater, but best mate was the hero of this age, and to the rising generation, he was their horse. And I, the people I feel most sorry for, actually, are the, the young people, the people who were my age when Arkell ran, because I was there the day that Arkell ran his last race at Campton Park. Disgracefully, I backed dormant. Um, but I remember, you know, I, and I remember the, the day he died very much, seeing the news on television and writing in my diary, I've still got it the day he died. Um, and I think I really feel sorry, I've had a lot of emails from young people who have just needed to feel somewhere to the touched base with, because for them it has been about, you know, that this horse that will be forever the reason they've got involved with our sport, and um, they've been denied that, and hopefully they'll live as long as we have in order to enjoy some, some, some great other horse in 30 or 40 years with whom they can com compare and they can be best mate boars like we have been Arkell boars all that time. Cheltenham was his stamping ground that brought Jim Lewis three gold cups. Just as Red Rum is buried at Aintree, so best mate's ashes have been interred hard by the focus of all interest at the top of that hill, the winning post. Best mate was foaled on a snowy winter's day in Ireland back in January 1995. The first born of the eight-year-old mare Cat Day and his sire was the ex-French stallion Ern Desperado. Well, we loved Ern Desperado, didn't we? Because we had been to see Ern Desperado where he stood at stud um, up near Nice at Declan Welds and we thought he was the most beautiful horse. And it was pure coincidence that this stallion that we had fallen in love with should have produced a horse that we also fell in love with and we thought that this, you know, this was the horse for us. And he'd been a very good racehorse as well and he'd met Declan Wells' criteria of winning 
the right group races in France to be a successful national hunt stallion. In November 1995, in the first of a series of moves that would be the shaping of him, Best Mate was sold to arguably the greatest repository of young jumps talent in Ireland. The new market on Fergus Farm of the legendary Tom Costello and Sons. We bought him as a foal in Tattersalls in the month of November. Um, he was for sale that day with a lot of other young horses. And um, we, we saw him early in the morning, myself and my father, and uh, we liked the look of him a lot. And uh, we bought him later on, very cheaply as it turned out. And my recollections of him at that stage was that he was a very gentle horse who basically would do anything you'd ask him to do. He was easy to ride out and, you know, just a pleasure to have around the place. He wanted to please you. His whole, his whole idea was, what do you want me to do, and I'll do it. He came in in his three-year-old days and we schooled him and brought him to a couple of race tracks and he was always a very good jumper. And the, net, the, net, the natural step at that stage was to go on and give him a run a pint a pint, which we've always found very beneficial for the young horses. And uh, he started off in Lismore pint a pint in Waterford. The rest of the field got off to a level break with Promatoos is the one who's leading him on towards this first. Well, he went to Lismore to buy a nice horse, maybe to win a gold cup, and we'd take some owners over. And um, during the, the parade, I saw this horse, and he was walking across. And I thought, what a lovely horse. He had presents. He's looking there, looking there. And uh, Hen went somewhere else, and it's actually pouring down with rain. And I watched this horse in the race. Colour's best mate races up there, also fight all the way home. And there On the day, he was absolutely, he was even better than I had hoped for. He jumped off in the first three or four, travelled very smoothly, jumped brilliantly. And with the ground being so heavy and everything, and he needing the run, I pulled him up at the third last, but I was very pleased with the run. He jumped from fence to fence, and two out he pulled up. I said, what did he put up for? Because he's getting a bit tired, I think, but maybe not. And um, I said to him afterwards, I see him, a very good horse. Best mate uh, won a point to point down in Nathan Rye, and there were only two runners, and I had won, and best mate was the other. Well, then, now then was my filly. And both of them came to the last together, and it was a case of who would win the last. But he jumped it a little bit better than I did, and I think he won by two or three lengths. But being a two-horse race, it was a very good race. My mare turned out to win three or four <coughs> races for Alan King in England. And uh, best mate went on to win three gold cups, so it just goes to prove that you don't go point to pointing because it's a two-horse race that you get a soft touch. It wasn't a soft touch. Great-looking Costello point-to-point -point winners are not two to the pound. Who would have the bucks to buy him? I wasn't particularly looking for one at that time. Um, Henrietta went to see him, Terry had spotted him at a point to point and she wrote to me, we always communicate by fax and she sent me this fax which said I've just seen the most beautiful horse I've ever seen. I trained him for nothing. I thought wow that's not a bad start is it you know. And, um, and so we went to Ireland uh, on the Tuesday and we met the great Tom Costello, and, which is a challenge in itself. And, uh, but he, was a, a, he had a, a great charm about him and he was very knowledgeable and, and he was very confident that this was a superb horse, you know. And um, so we finally got into the, into the stables and um, I can remember thinking to myself, well, on Desperado, and that was another reason why Henrietta wanted me to look at it, because he was a f French bred on Desperado. And um, I'd heard that they were a bit flighty. I don't know who would put this thing in my head, but it was there, you see. And I said to Tom Costello, I thought, well, in any case, a comment might drop the price a bit anyway, you see. I understand they can be a little bit sort of uh, flighty, these Tom. He said, not this one, he said. And he shouted for the boy to open the door. They opened the door and, and this horse just appeared at the door, you know, as if, you know, here I am, you know. And I looked at him and I knew instantly why Henrietta and Terry was so impressed with him. And he hadn't even got out the stable yet, you know. And anyway, we, he walked out and Tom took him into this huge loose school. 
and it might just as well as have been a, a circus as far as best mate was concerned because he strutted round there and sort of said well when are you ready you know and he jumped these fences in this indoor school with such grace and agility you know you'd have had to be mad not to have been impressed with him you know and all I'm thinking is wonderful but I'm never going to buy him I've already heard about Tom Costello and um, and his prices you know <clears throat> and so finally I said to him Tom I think you're going to break my heart no it will not break your heart he said and uh, we, we, we sort of went then and had lunch would you have a drink said, no I won't have a drink Tom I wonder if I want to be certainly sober and uh, and so Terry and Henrietta left us on our own and we just sat there talking and I, even to this day I can't explain what I did and and, and I'm, I'm sure that Tom finds this very hard to, to, to listen to but we talked about a price which I said you know was just totally out of the question and then I thought well I'll try one and I reached my hand out to him and I mentioned a figure to shake his hand and there was a hesitation I left my hand out there and he grabbed it and he said this price will be between you and I I said that's a deal Tom even his sons don't know what we paid I think he also wanted Henrietta to have a horse of that nature I think he thought that she would know how to to look after him you know well he came over with another horse in fact there were two horses we bought that day from Tom Costello and, and I'm, I'm not sure that the Costellos didn't think that the other horse was better. Uh, but they came over together, they did everything together that spring. It was in, on April the 1st that they first arrived, 1999. And uh, the, the lads in the yard, they just rode them out and hacked them out and we got to know them. He was just like an ordinary horse that had come from Ireland. Nobody particularly looked at him and said, goodness me, this is something special. But we, we were pretty excited about these two youngsters. Being April, of course, we were still running horses on the track and we were all quite busy with the racing. And um, I think they were just taken for granted, two more young ones from Ireland. But he was um, very quick to settle in, very quick to, uh, to find his feet here. And uh, we had a good rider in the yard at the time called Paddy Young. And Paddy said one day when he'd ridden him that he thought he was the uh, nicest horse he'd ever sat on and he'd ridden a lot of young horses. Best mate had done plenty of learning in Ireland and at Hens. The time had come for the race course. We entered him for a hurdle race at Newbury but it was an EBF hurdle race and you have to, the stallion has to be registered in the EBF scheme and it so happened for the year that best mate was born and Desperado had not been registered and so matey was not eligible for any of these EBF races. So as he was fit and ready to go, I remember ringing up Jim Lewis and saying, not the original plan, we don't usually like to run a point-to-point -point horse back into a bumper, but I think we'll have to run him in the bumper at Cheltenham because he can't go in a hurdle race and there's a long wait until we find a hurdle race for him. So that's why he went to Cheltenham. For a run. They're about to swing the corner. They're racing now inside the final quarter mile here. Southern Star, the leader, travelling very strongly in front with Best Mate, who's now looming up on the outside under Jim Cullity. Hard to start. has got a run through on the inner. He's moved into third place. Captain Zinzan is next. And then on the inner is Pippins Ford, who's only got the one pace. They're racing now up the hill. And inside the final furlong, Southern Star and Best Mate locked in combat on the far side. Switch for run is hard to start. Best Mate beginning to wear down Southern Star and Best Mate goes half a length up flying at the finish is hard to start but Best Mate is all out to hold on Best Mate a good winner from hard to start second Southern Star third and a yawning gap back then to Captain Zinzan who took fourth That's number five, second number eight well, I remember going to the unsaddling enclosure after that bumper uh, and it was you know, in the sort of failing light at Cheltenham on the last day and um, a few of the press people came round me and I remember saying to one or two of them, take a good look at this horse, because you could see a lot more of him, and he could be back here a good few more times, because we think he's quite special, and one or two of them have never forgotten that. You can hardly make a better start than by winning a bumper at Cheltenham, and immediately best mate 
had his attention turned to hurdles. At the moment to Roscoe running in second, like the fuses in third, the last flight, and um, best mate is up and over safely. Jim Colotti now just pushes him out, hands and heels, and away he goes. Running in second is Roscoe, like the fuse, beer more, and running water behind these, but this is a good victory, an easy one as well. Best mate and Jim Colotti have bolted up. Roscoe home in second place. Beer more is in third, like the fuse was fourth. Five weeks after the first hurdles win, best mate was back at Sandown in January 2000 to face a much taller order in the Grade One Tolworth hurdle. And two quick hurdles confront them now, and it's Monsignor and Norman Williamson just turning the tap. But best mate, and here comes Snowdrop on the outside with that scampering stride through on the inner. Dr. Goddard is finding it's a bit much at this level. Here we are, two out. Monsignor, a good jump in second place. His best mate who's trying to quicken the game. Snowdrop is uh, just looking a bit one pace now. Back in fourth is Dr. Goddard. Down towards the final flight, and Monsignor comes to it. Kicks and goes over well. Best mate is trying to close down. They've still got 150 yards to go. And it's Monsignor who's going to make it three from three. And as they stride up towards the line, Monsignor wins the Sun. King of the Punters tall with hurdle. What an asset to the game. This is going to be Monsignor's race and easy. To best mate unbeaten was before the race. It's a... We were a bit disappointed at Sandown because I thought maybe he'd come out and win. But... I think Monsignor was probably a very good horse. He never fulfilled the potential because he, he hurt himself. But he was a top-class horse. Uh, and in the uh, looking back over it, as Terry says, I think that the ground was possibly a little bit against us. We later got to know Matey better and knew that he always wanted the best ground to be at his best. And I think it was a little bit tacky up the hill at Sandown and uh, the other horse got the first run. So we were, we were, we were happy enough. We were possibly at the time a little bit disappointed that we'd been beaten, but on retrospect it was a good run. I wasn't deflated by it at all, you know. And then when we get to Cheltenham for the Supreme Novices, we, we didn't know whether to run him in the Supreme Novices or whether to run him in, in the Son Alliance, you see. And so we had our usual vote, which is what we do, and uh, faxes go the fours and the against and whatever, and my vote is, you see, and I went for the Supreme Novices, and, and so did Hen. Uh, I think Terry had an inkling that he thought he was finally a stay, he would have liked to have gone for the two and a half. But I was slightly sort of uh, relieved that I hadn't got to run against this Monsignor again. Yeah. Towards the final three flights of hurdles, with about five furlongs left to cover, and it's sounds Alito Bay on the inside in the noseband, Far Dante Flyer, Dust Jewel, out wide is Roddock over three out, You'll Never Walk Alone, a good jump off the inside. They're followed then by Silence Reigns, Best Mate is now driven along, as they run to the second last, Sausalito Bay, Far Dante Flyer, Roddick on the outside, and you'll never walk alone right there on the inside, poised to challenge as they landed over two out. Best mate is rallying in behind them. Then Silence Reigns, six horses bursting away from East Well Hall with Mr. Lamb making late headway, rounding the final turn. Sausalito Bay now joined by Far Dante Flyer and Roddick. Here comes the favourite, you'll never walk alone on the outside. Wider out, best mate over the final flight, Sausalito. Bay, Far Dante Flyer, Mr. Lamb down at the last. It's Sausalito Bay still in front from Far Dante Flyer. You'll never walk alone trying to get on terms with his fellow Irishman. Best mate coming home well under the stands rail, but Sausalito Bay is holding on grimly and Sausalito Bay holds on to win. Best mate was second, then you'll never walk alone. Roddick was fourth, followed home by Far Dante Flyer. Then he... Well, actually, I wasn't that disappointed because I was thrilled to have been second. But when I look back at it and I saw the film, and I, because as you know, I don't watch races very well, um, it was only then that I realised that if everything had gone right, he would have won that race. Um, but, you know, you can't do it, get everything right, and I don't think it took away from the horse's ability. Jim Collardy, Jim Collardy, who is a, a very honest and truthful chap, if you ask him, he'll, he'll tell you that he felt that he ought to have won the Supreme Novices. He followed um, You'll Never Walk Alone, and Terry said, as soon as You'll Never Walk Alone goes, you go with him. Well, of course, You'll Never Walk Alone never went, you know. And, um, and I think Jim thought, I think I've had it now. They were all the press criticising him, you see, and he said, oh, you know, I'll get jocked off that, you see. So anyway, I said to Terry, I want you to phone Jim now for me, please. 
and tell him I'll never jock him off. I never did. Well, of course, I wanted to put him out in the field as soon as he, no. as soon as he'd, um, as soon as he'd won, he'd been second at Cheltenham. But uh, understandably, you know, Jim wanted to go to Liverpool, and uh, it wasn't uh, on paper a particularly hot race, even though Copeland was a good horse. They four runners, and runners. it was a very small runner race. And uh, obviously, afterwards, we were we were pleased we had made the decision. We and just he, and he won it very and made easily. It and on the bridle. Mm, the ground was quite quick and he, yeah. he, he was very His happy. The ground was there and where he went. Wonderful business play that was. Mm. Clear. Copeland's now taken Harvest's measure and looks the main danger as they come down towards the second last. It's best mate trying to run the finish out of Copeland. A length and a half between them as they come to the second last. Best mate takes it too clear from Copeland who's rather out to the left. Back in third, Harvest is a spent force. Down towards the final flight, best mate. Three lengths clear now as he comes to take it. Copeland under pressure from Tony McCoy. The last, best mate jumps it well. Copeland still in with a squeak the far side but has three lengths to find and time's running out best mate's weary he's wandering over to the stand side tony mccoy trying hard on copeland the far side but best mate's got enough he's a length and a half clear and pushed out to the line gains compensation for his unlucky defeat at cheltenham best mate wins for henrietta knight and jim callity in second is copeland a battle for third goes to harvest just holding barney no yeah. best mate's first season had oozed promise an arguably unfortunate second at the festival and victory at Aintree placed him among the most exciting prospects in the country. But Henrietta and Terry had always seen the horse as a chaser, and in common with all their charges, he had a painstaking education on the jumping front before being unleashed over fences for the first time at Exeter. Well, I go the other way, go on. The bridle best mate and goes to the front now as they run down towards the final fence and best mate from Binderwee up on the outside. This is the final fence. Not Lovely even the most extreme mate. psychic Lovely watching that day fences. would have and predicted that the first, the second and third would win three gold cups, a grand national and a Thomas Pink between them. Well, I, I always knew or hoped that he, would, that he wouldn't fall because he was so good at his fences and he was so clever, you know. And he wasn't flamboyant, was he? he? He would measure the fence and as economically as possible, he jumped the fence. So that was never, ever a problem to him. It was only a question of the pace in the race. He used to, he travelled so well, you know. So you did go there with confidence. Three in a line as they race on down towards the second from home. Here comes Best Mate on the outside of Dust Jewel, touching down together with Fatal Care. Dust Jewel all but over and out. He's recovered brilliantly there. He slipped on landing. That's been virtually pulled up by Norman Williamson. He's eased into a canter, and Best Mate in the meantime is showing his class. He's opened up four lengths now on Fatal Care. Dust. Jewel is continuing a distance of 15 lengths behind back in third. What an unfortunate mishap, but best mate comes up towards the 12th and final fence, up towards it and over in great style from Fatal Care, who jumped over in second. Let's see how Dust Jewel takes it. Jumped it beautifully. So it's a case of uh, what might have been here, but best mate is going to make it two out of two in pretty brilliant fashion here. After Cheltenham, best mate was carded for one of the season's most significant stepping stones for a novice chaser the Silly Isles at Sandown. Paddock watchers were beginning to become increasingly familiar with this ludicrously handsome chaser loping round not a care in the world before his races. Could he really be as good as he looked? And it's Hannigan's Lodger, the long-time leader, with Crocodile in the yellow and white jacket on the outside. Best mate just coasting in behind in third, then Redemption. Logician has picked off Exit to Wave, who's run a bit disappointing following his Ascot win. As they make for the final turn and Crocodile D now goes on from Hannigan's Lodger, who's paying the penalty for setting a good early pace. Best mate goes after Crocodile, still going well enough. Redemption back in fourth as they run towards two out. Crocodile challenged now by Best mate on the outside. They're clear of Hannigan. Best mate quickens up smartly in between the last two. Oh, he looks a good horse, this. Best mate from Crocodile. They're clear of Hannigan's Lodger. The final fence for Best mate, and he skips over it merrily. From in second, Crocodile is completely outclassed. 
best. Then in third is Hannigan's Lodger, and racing up the hill towards the line, best mate is going to retain his unbeaten records over fences and looks a right candidate for the article. Best mate, the winner. Remember a very good old friend of Terry's, uh, a jockey friend and, uh, and a good friend of mine as well, Dave Dick, very famous jockey. He rang us up in the car on the way back from Sandown after Best Mate had won the Silly Isles and uh, was just couldn't stop talking about the horse and he'd never seen anything like it. And surely we were going to run in the Gold Cup. I mean, that was a Gold Cup performance, even though, uh, even though he'd, you know, he'd, uh, he'd only a young horse. I'd seen him win that novice chase at Sandown. It was the Silly Isles novice chase. And I must say, I was tremendously taken by the turn of foot that he showed between the last two fences. You see that very rarely uphill at Sandown at the end of a race, winter's afternoon, going a bit holding, particularly in a novice. He was impressive and uh, he won with great aplomb and majesty, didn't he? And, and then you start thinking, this is a, a very, very good horse, you know, and, um, and then the attention multiplies, you know. And then, of course, came the dreaded foot and mouth disease, you know. Cheltenham was on, it was off, it was on, it was off. He was odds on favourite, I think, to win the Arkle. And of course it never happened. And, um, but then again, that's all part of the way it goes, isn't it, you know? And um, so he didn't finally reach his, his highest accolade, perhaps, uh, as a novice chaser. With Cheltenham a non-runner, best mate was sent once more to Aintree and what's more, switch back to hurdles. It was a tactical error compounded by deeply grotty ground. In retrospect, that was a mistake probably to have gone to Liverpool because the ground was atrocious and he got beaten by Barton, but he ran a courageous race, but he was never happy, he never jumped a hurdle never properly. Never jumped. And... Uh, it proved a point early on in their career with the horse. He wanted good, good, good to soft ground, you know, anything worse. He couldn't adapt himself with the spring and agility he had, you know. They all say good horses have gone any ground, which um, they, they don't actually. But I mean, that day he still ran a very credible race, you know. And Barton was basic champion, uh, favourite champion hurdle and everything like that. But um, he still ran, ran his heart out, didn't he? He did, but he wasn't happy that day. And we knew then that that was the wrong sort of ground for him. And now they head down towards the final flight. And Barton now hits the front and goes on by two or three lengths to Mr. Cool. Bounce back, can't go with them. Now the best mate. Here's the last for Barton. He's over safely. Tony Dobbin and Barton. Five lengths clear now from Mr. Cool. Another eight lengths or so back to best mate. Bounce back, back in fourth place. But he's back with a bang here, Barton. He flopped last time badly at Cheltenham. But this is the real horse. Barton galloping on red resolutely in the conditions to win the Martel Aintree hurdle in the colours of Stan Clark. One more time for Barton. Great to see him back to his best. He slogs it out and beats them handsomely. Tight for second. Best mate. Basically couldn't get out of his own way. He never jumped a hurdle all the way around. But the ground was bottomless now. They were going to their knees in it. You know, he just couldn't cope with it. He had so much heart. He plugged away. He was beaten by Barton, who absolutely loved it, and skated away from him. But best mate, being best mate, wouldn't give in. He hated the ground. He was like a leg in, each, in four different parishes, um, kicking hurdles out of the ground because he just couldn't get out of the ground to get over them. And but still, he plugged away and finished second in a good race. You know, um, that was all heart. That was pure heart because everything was wrong for him. I can remember him walking back into the enclosure, covered in mud. You've never seen anything like it, you know. And I remember thinking to myself. Sorry about that, matey. We wouldn't do that again, eh? You know, because that was why we were all so sensitive about the ground that we all agreed he'll never run in that again. At West Lockinge Farm, part of the key to success is attention to every detail. Henrietta doesn't send her beloved charges out to do battle half prepared. We don't really want to leave any stone unturned, and if you're an athlete, you've got to be completely fit, all the muscles have got to be working. And if he does this dressage work, he has to be more supple and, and get the muscles developing in the right places. And just, just like doing a bit more limbering up. It's something different for him, he hasn't got to think of galloping and it sort of relaxes him and it makes him hold himself and balance himself. 
a lot of the horses do it. The following season opened with an egg and spoon renewal of the Holden Gold Cup at Exeter. Best mate winning in a common canter. And then comes Vidalco back in third. Sankos continuing fourth, so they're racing to the final fence in the WilliamHill.co.uk. Holden Gold Cup, best mate out clear and up and over it in real style here. So coming up the run in. At the end of November, he made his debut in Handicap Company, carrying top weight and conceding 20 pounds and upwards to his three opponents in the valuable first National Gold Cup at Ascot, for which he was sent off at 13 to 8 on. That particular day, I had Edge Dombleu running in the Peterborough Chase. I think trying to win it for the third time. Matey was was a young lad, you know, and uh, Edra Dombler had was a matured old boy, and I thought, well, I hadn't ought to desert old Blue. I'll let Matey go and win it on his own, you know. And uh, ironically, there, there was about 10 minutes between the two races, you know. And uh, so off Edra Dombler went, and he won the Peterborough Chase, you see, so we're all chuffed about that. And then we scootle then off to the uh, to watch the, the television whips drawn on best mate he goes to the front but so far lacking the zest of previous performances best mate on the outside of logician then comes wahiba sands and dusk jewel down towards the last logician is still in there fighting best mate is now called on for maximum effort then comes wahiba sands they're down towards the last and best mate is very weary in front wahiba sands logician and dusk jewel and wahiba sands putting the challenge down to best mate and takes it up over the last it's Wahiba Sands, best mate, is forced to dig very deep to retain the unbeaten record. Up to the line, Wahiba Sands, best mate, is very gallant, but the weight may be proving decisive. And Wahiba Sands will complete a treble for Martin Pipe and floor best mate in the first National Gold Cup. In third, Dust Jewel, and a good national trial by Logician in fourth. And I don't think he was totally happy that day because Jim Cullity wasn't t um, totally, didn't think he was totally himself. And he'd had a journey to the race course with a rather fractious mare we had called Returning, who'd kicked the horse box to pieces on the way over. And I think this is quite unsettled, matey. And uh, for the first time in his life, he was um, sweating up at the start. And uh, he wasn't really himself. And Jim just didn't think he was sparkling at all. It was over two miles, three and a half furlongs, short of best mate's best. Um, so I decided to ride him handier. And I can remember Mick Fitzgerald kind of sat in our girth. I don't know if it was a racing plan or not, but he sat in our girth and best mate was keen all the way and rushing at his fences, never jumped, never got in a rhythm. In the end, I let him just bowl on because I thought at least he'll stay. And the ground was softer than ideal and he got tired up the hill, but it was just a complete non-event. Again, I wished I'd done what Tony McCoy did that day and what he was saying, I should have dropped in last let the race unfold in front of me and then gone on and won and I can if I could ride that race again I could guarantee you he'd win Johnny handstands Ascot was a reverse and worse was to come for Cullity four days later he broke his right arm which had already been pinned two years earlier after another fall he was out of action for weeks and just days before best mates next run Tony McCoy was drafted in to replace him the decision to run him in, in the King George was taken at Newbury and we all sat around having a cup of tea in the autumn sunshine and I said to Henrietta, we, have, we need to make our minds up, you see. And we chatted about it and we said, the question is whether he would stay. And Terry said, I think he will stay if you ride him to stay, you see. And so basically that's what Tony did, you know. And I'm quite sure that if Tony had the time over again, if Terry had the time over again, the conversation would never have taken place. And we might have just won that, King George. Pink jacket, best mate waiting in the wings. Out wide is Fidelco, then legal right and go ballistic is struggling. At the next open pitch, a big jump there by Florida Paul, a mistake, more a blunder in fact by Bacchanal on the inside in third, as best mate creeps a little bit closer. They go towards the next. Fence number 15, and it's Florida Pearl from first goal. Bacchanal, best mate, is poised to mount his challenge under Tony McCoy. And then legal right and Fidelco, the last in the back straight. Florida Pearl lands two lengths ahead. 
of first goal. Backer now driven along. Best mate appears to be coasting in fourth place, but now the tap is being turned full on as they begin the swing out of the back straight. And it's Florida Pearl on the inside of Backer now and first gold, who's now rousted along out wide by Terry Dumen. Best mate creeping forward up the inside. They've got three fences left to jump in the King George. And it's Florida Pearl, second last year, a bridesmaid on so many occasions. Backer now challenging first goal just appears to be struggling now on the outside as they jump three up first goal clambered through that best mate in third place is now beginning to move forward but florida pearl still going strongly in front florida pearl got in a bit tight over two out back and now landed second best mate trying to challenge between the pair they race down towards the final fence can florida pearl win the king george he's two legs clear here's best mate challenging under tony mccoy florida pearl sails over the last best mate now Got a fight on his hooves on the outside. Florida Pearl, can he hang on today? Best mate in second, and Florida Pearl will win the King George, and no horse deserves it more. Best mate in second, Bacchanal in third. First gold wilted in the straight, could only finish fourth this time. Legal right in fifth, then for Things now. didn't go quite right that day, did they? No, it just happened. Uh, AP done anything right. Um, he pulled out um, before turning straight, got a position, and um, they sort of shut him in a bit, you know. So he got stuck on the inner and wanted to. The old Florida Pearl, he made his run. Turn AP got out. Um, the old horse had gone, and the baby was behind him, and the baby could never catch him up. Florida Pearl was a very good horse on his day. Very good horse. And he got the first run, and he was a very good horse on Maybe, a flat, yeah. flat course like Kempton. And uh, I've never really thought that that was made his best course at Kempton. Mm. We, we talked about it a lot because he, he probably wasn't at his best uh, on, a, on a sharpish right-handed course. He loved to finish with a hill. And uh, obviously, as everybody mm. knows, Kempton is fairly flat. But AP did say, he said, um, I got to him before anyone else. He said, um, I should have won. I said, don't worry about it. There's only one winner. We're second today. What do you do? The first day, first King George he ran in at Kempton, the ground was quick and there was still a little bit of frost in the ground and um, after that he was quite, I think the expression one would use is stumped up and he, although he's, sure he his legs were fine, uh, there was nothing you could see but when you went to walk and trot him he didn't move with his usual fluency, he didn't have that lovely sort of bounce to his stride and uh, he was very much as though somebody had sort of hit him on the shoulders with a hammer and he was just feeling jolly sore. Mm. And uh, it took him about three weeks to, to get better from Kempton. And of course, didn't give us very much time because by the end of January, we wanted to be galloping him again for the Gold Cup in March. And um, we had to go very slowly with him and let him recover. And we put him out in the paddock and let him sort of move about out there and, and get better naturally. But uh, it was a bit of a worry because he, his action seemed to have gone temporarily. Luckily, it all, all came back again and, and, and he was fine when we got to Cheltenham. So, with the all-important month of January sacrificed on the altar of the King George, absolutely everything would have to go right in the run-up to best mate's first Gold Cup. Terry and Hen never lost faith in best mate. And, and it was this faith, I think, that, that spurred us all along, you know. So we went along with the, with the confidence. And, uh, but of course the pundits were saying, he's only seven years old, he's only had six races, and this is a big test, and uh, he's up against experienced horses. And, and you know, you read all these things, and, and they're far more experienced people than you are, and you think, well, maybe that's so. And the, the betting was eight to one. In fact, he was 20 to one at one stage. And my brother, bless him, who would always have 30 quid at the weekend, instead of having his lucky 15s and whatever, he backed best mate every, every time, at every weekend, at whatever price he was, you know. And he went off at 7 to 1, didn't he? Come the day, best mate was joint youngest Gold Cup contender at 7 and sent off third favourite in the 18-strong field. Going to first Gold Cup, I thought I'd probably win put it that way. I was as confident as you can be for a horse going into a race like that for the first time. But you know, I knew he'd cope with the ground, I knew he'd stay, I knew he'd jump, um, I knew he'd cope with the hill at the end. 
he would cope with the hype of the big occasion. You know, I kind of, I, I knew he'd cope with everything, and I thought, you know, I probably put a lot of pressure on myself because I thought, you know, he should win. With the last minutes ticking away to her first Gold Cup runners, the priority for Henrietta was to disappear and find somewhere to hide where she could watch the race in relative peace. Jonathan Powell said I could go and watch it in a quiet place. It wasn't that quiet, but I sat next to uh, Charles Edgerton again, and he um, watched it with me. He brought me luck before, you see, my superstitions. He brought me luck with the bumper, so I thought, well, I'll, I'll stick to Edgy. And uh, we watched it in the little press tent behind the, the weighing room. At the next plane fence, and it was still Seymour business, along with looks like trouble. They come close together on the flat as they now run towards the water jump once again. Out wide Florida Pearl of Fox Chapel King, and then Lord Noerly and Bay Rajan at this water. And these are, are followed by Best Mate and also by Bacchanal in the pink colours beginning to get into the race now, Mick Fitzgerald. Lord Noerly still on the inside in the green at this next open ditch. Barajan was a slow jumper there. And now towards another plane fence, a reminder for Bacchanal, given the hurry up. Onto the next plane one, still looks like trouble and Seymour business. The two past Gold Cup winners are still showing their rivals the way here. They know which way round it goes here at Presbury Park. Best mate travelling very strongly on their heels now. Lord Noerly his stable companion on the inside as they jump this next big open ditch looks like trouble over in front from Seymour Business Shotgun Willie is tailing right off Cypher Malta is also in trouble another plane fence Richard Johnson steals a half glance on the leader looks like trouble he sees Seymour Business on his outside as they jump the next plane one followed by Fox Chapel King and best mate and then Lord Noerly behind these They've only got four to jump. Comanche Court and Florida Pearl are still right there, and Marlborough is beginning to get into the race as well. They run towards the fourth last then, back to this tricky fence. Looks like trouble and see more business as they take it. They're in the air together. Best mate over in third, still coasting along for Jim Cullity. Then Fox Chapel King and Comanche Court. Florida Pearl on the outside, followed by Lord Early, Marlborough, Sackville, Moscow Express, and Alexander Banquet. This is the third last fence in the Coach Chelsea Gold Cup, an old Seymour business. The winner in 99 took it first, but best mate looks a big threat on the inside. Looks like trouble in Comanche Court, still there with every chance. And they are clear of Fox Chapel King and Marlborough running round the final turn. Seymour Business challenged now by Comanche Court, a past triumph hurdle winner at this meeting. Cullity begins to nudge away on best mate. They've got two fences left to jump then, and Comanche Court takes over, going to two out. Comanche Court rises first, dived at it. Seymour Business, best mate over on the inside. They've got one fence left to jump now, and it's best mate who takes over narrowly to Comanche Court. Here's the final fence. Alexander Banquet, Moscow Express next. They were clear of Cypher Malta and Fox Chapel King. Then Lord Noerly and Florida Pearl and Bacchanal and Bay Rajan. Looks like trouble has walked past the judge in the end. Here she is emerging from her bolt hole. She's trained the winner of the Cheltenham Gold Cup. And reticence turns into hurry. She's off to find her hero. There's Terry Biddlecombe, who was such a hero here at Cheltenham in his riding day here. Now the husband of best mates trainer Henrietta Knight. They are jumping's most popular couple. A truly romantic tale. Doesn't get any better than that, Jim. Actually, it's a, well, I was he's a good horse, but, but I made a couple of mistakes and had to sit in him for a minute, but he always comes back on it, you know. Yeah. He's just got the engine there, you know. He always was cruising behind them, though, wasn't he? Always cruising, and I've got squeezed a little bit. Joe has come across me, but I wasn't panicking because I didn't really want to be there that soon anyway. Yeah. Um, I just had to wait for the split when they straightened up and left it them. Guns picked up. You were so relaxed yourself, Jim. You seem very cool. Well done. <laughs> I don't know about that, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, the defining moment of your career. You'll never forget this. No, never. Thank you. Well done.
An absolutely fabulous result for the game, this too. He's a proper horse, one of the two seven-year-olds in the field. And a fantastic prospect for the future. Describe it. How can you possibly expect or have the audacity to win a Gold Cup? He's only a young horse. I've had some good fun in my day, Derek. I never th ever thought that I could win a Gold Cup. To win a Gold Cup with a horse so young, I could cry, Derek. I bet you But could. I could love it. It was the afternoon when years of hope were distilled into minutes of magic. For best mates' closest connections and growing band of followers, the most important mission in jumping had been accomplished. He was a young Gold Cup winner with the ball at his feet. Now it was back to Duck Heaven at West Lockinge and the long build-up towards a repeat performance. A major key to best mate was the way he rationed his effort. Like a schoolboy, he would do his homework, but there was no need to overdo it. He wasn't actually a great workhorse at home, and probably got <clears throat> probably got a bit more so like that over the years. You know, he'd, he'd do he'd do his work, and he'd be, you know, if he was a human, he'd have a smile on his face. You know, he'd have his ears pricked and the whole lot, and he'd do his work, but he wouldn't kill himself. You know, but they're they're usually the best horses, the ones that save it for the race course. After chilling out through the heat of summer, best mate was targeted to make his comeback eight months on from Cheltenham in the Peterborough Chase at Huntingdon. Now he's, he's been in, um, super to get ready for this race. I mean, he's done nothing wrong and he's in great form. So we're just uh, fingers crossed. Another season and a few more months of the team's nerves jangly away in the glare of media attention. Frankly, I'll be glad when it's over, Derek, because yeah. he's our Ming Vaz, our Koh-Noor Diamond, and, uh, and I wish I hadn't got him out now. So. Oh, well, yeah. he's here, everybody's here, millions watching on TV, yes. and he looks really well. He does look very well, doesn't he? Yeah, he does. And, uh, and I think he, he knows that, uh, that he's got to do it today, and, uh, and I hope he puts the frog in his place, and, uh, and all is well, eh? as they run round the final turn then, making this longish run, and Geos comes under pressure, as best mate still continues to gallop on strongly, with two fences left to jump. It's best mate then, from Geos in second place, what will Doos Doos find on the inside? He needs to jump better than he has done. Here's the second last, best mate. Oh, he didn't get very high there. Doos Doos was on his nose on the inside, but is challenging now. Geos is back in third. The whip is up now for best mate, running for the final fence. Best mate on the right, Doos Doos on the left. Geos back in third, the final fence. Best mate, he met this one. Well, Doos Doos gave it away there, jumped away to the right. Best mate, it's only workmanlike, but he's drawing away now on the flat from Doos Doos and Geoff and the Gold Cup winner is back with a win here and gets a great reception from the Huntington crowd. Best mate wins the Peterborough chase. Doos Doos in second, Geoff is third. They're a long way clear of Tresor de Mai and Castle Prince. So best mate returning to unsaddle here after this victory. Just wondering there whether there might be a slight discharge coming from the horse's nostril as he walks back towards the winner's enclosure here. That nasal discharge became part and parcel of Best Mate for more than a year and dated from an early morning scare just two months prior to hunting. Terry and I were feeding in the morning and uh, Terry always fed Best Mate at about 5.30 in the morning and uh, I was feeding another horse a bit further along the line and Terry suddenly said to me, come quick, come quick, this horse is not right. And he got to bait his box and his head was, was covered in blood, his eye was covered in blood. He had a, looks like he'd been in a boxing match and um, he'd obviously been in, a, in the wars in the night and got cast. And uh, it just wasn't right at all, he was, as, you know, as they were semi-concussed. And also, he'd um, damaged his side of his face, 
and um, there was a lot of blood coming out of his nostril on the right side and uh, inside the horse's head there are a lot of little, little gaps called sinuses and um, obviously he sort of fairly well squashed these in and there was quite a lot of discharge and, and, and mucus, mucus and stuff would come out of this side of his nostril for very many months afterwards. In fact, when we used to gallop him and race him all that next year, there would always be a bit of white and a bit of sort of, Terry looked call it like sea fret, sort of in his nose. And um, <laughs> people were looking at him and thinking, oh goodness me, they raced a horse with a terrible it's cough or cold, a snotty nose. It was not that at all, it was just this, this coming out from his sinuses. Boxing Day is the season's busiest. Hen clucks over arrangements as best mate is prepared for his departure to Kempton and the King George. Nice. As ever, he's in the trusted hands of last Jackie Jenner, nice. who looks after him at home and only ever leaves his side during the race yeah. itself. I'm going to turn some of these lights off. Save electricity. The lights may be going out in wantage. The question is whether best mate's horsepower is going to illuminate the afternoon at Kempton. <laughs> The King George is the prestige mid-season highlight, the horse's last planned outing before Cheltenham. Second in the race 12 months earlier, he's hot favourite to go one better. This is an important one. Here comes best mate and his best mate, Jackie Dennett. Does he, he walks faster than he can? He, he walks very fast, it keeps me fit. <laughs> now what's he been doing over the past couple of days? He's, um, he's had a sort of just regular canters and that and he had a couple of quick canters yesterday yeah. just to give him a bit of a pipe opener but he's ever so well in great form. How do you think he compares to last year? He feels stronger than last year, he's filled out more yeah. and feels a lot stronger across the shoulders and neck. He does. And, and he's grown up a bit as well, he, he doesn't kick and buck so much now. <laughs> do you think he'll win today? I think so, I hope so. Well, tell you what, he's walking, I'll leave you to it. <laughs> Thank you. Good luck, Jackie. Thank you. Good luck, best mate. And you have to feel sorry for Jim Colletti because every time <laughs> Every time we got to this sort of big race, something may happen to him, you know. And, um, and so we obviously chose uh, AP, one, because he'd already ridden him, two, because he knew the horse and he, had, he did have great faith in him. And so Tony got the ride. Jaws the sixth chase and it's Doos Doos that regains the advantage having been out jumped by best mate at the previous obstacle. And they're followed closely by Back and Alan Marlborough as they take this next plane one. Doos Doos best mate. Florida Pearl on the inside of Marlborough. Back and Al is stoked along and a bit more than that now. He feels the warmth of Mick Fitzgerald's whip. Native Upmanship is cruising through as well. As they approach the next best mate was switched up the inside of Doos Doos. It was a slightly awkward landing but he didn't lose any ground. Florida Pearl follows him. They've got two more to take in the back straight and then three more in the home straight after that. And Best Mate's going to take this just about in front. A beautiful leap at it too from Doos Doos. Back and Alley staying on again. He's a, a doer galloper. Florida Pearl still going well. So too Marlborough. And Native hump, Upmanship is just hunting them up as well. Best Mate wasn't quite so quick over four out. Florida Pearl draws to within a neck now. Back and Alley's three deep. They're on the turn. Marlborough is fourth. Native Upmanship gets a slap, then Doos Doos, they're the leading half dozen on turning in, and it's best mate and Tony McCoy, he's riding more positively 12 months on than he did last year, Florida Pearl last year's winner chases in second, back and now still there, though it's been hard work on the outside, Marlborough next, then Native Upmanship and they're well strung out, they've got three fences left across, and it's the Gold Cup winner, best mate, that draws to it with the lead, leads by two lengths to Florida Pearl, who nods on landing, Marlborough stays on, back and now but they're all going to have to fight and dig hard before the, if they're going to catch this best mate. Marlborough closes up, going to two out. Marlborough lands almost upside best mate, and it's Marlborough produced by Timmy Murphy. Best mate trying to fight back on the far side. Back and Alice third. Florida Pearl has cried enough. They've got one fence left to go. Best mate hard driven. Marlborough the challenger on the near side over the last. They take it together. Stride for stride. Can best mate find a little bit more from Marlborough? Sands, and they are the only finishers. Lord Noly pulled up 
flagship of Morales is pulled up. So in a sense, two, after two, their Kempton defeat 12 months right. earlier, best mate in AP better. had put the record straight and had to dig pretty deep to do so. He, he hit the front a little bit earlier than, than we would have liked, but as I said, the one thing that he, he was guaranteed to do was stay, and, and the second year that I rode him, I made much more use of his stamina. I was more aggressive on him, which subsequently we said that didn't really suit the horse, but um, for me, on, on, on the day that the second time I rode him in the King George, I think it was the right way to ride him, and it, and it proved the right way, because he won, so, um, but he was he was a fantastic horse, and as I said, having won three Gold Cups, it was equally as good a performance to win the King George, too. He was very tough that day because the ground was getting a bit soft then, and he did battle well actually. Yeah, and um, he was a he, he, he's a very intelligent horse. When he got to the front, he started to pull up. The crowd was cheering, which was wonderful. And uh, and then he sort of, where am I? You know, what am I doing here? You know. Then <laughs> Marlborough came at him, and uh, he put his head again. He went the last two or three strides. One half a length, you know. So. You win one, you lose one. AP said as soon as he, he hit the front, it was almost as though he, he was sort of listening to the crowds. Um, he didn't feel that he, you know, he wasn't concentrating once he'd gone to the front until he really had to get hold mm. of him again. AP loved him. Mm, he adored him. He was, that was the occasion when AP came back into the, into the unsaddling enclosure and then said to the press, I'd like to marry him. <laughs> <laughs> no horse had won back-to-back -back gold cups for 32 years. And as Cheltenham approached, the pressure ratcheted up inexorably by the day. Everything worries me what, every moment of the day. She's a bit of a nightmare at the moment. Everybody Thanks. gets... What about yourself? <laughs> um, hey, I'm talking about the people in the yard. They say, rather than, I mean, she yeah. doesn't miss them, which is rather fun, actually. They're having a fair few sharpness from me at the moment. She's going well, I promise you. I'm pretty good, actually. I do keep me calm. Well, you're quite calm anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no, but she needs a bit of sort of comfort and, you know, and looking after and steady, keep it cool. Woo, 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 woo. The thing I remember most about it was this feeling of pride that I've got a gold cup winner and he's walking around this ring, you know. And um, winning again was, would be nice, but winning the first time was enough for me, you know. But I've got a gold cup winner here, you know. For Jim Lewis, the most sharing of owners, the public pleasures are punctuated by private moments when the world retreats and he's on his tod. The most lonely time that I ever had with Best Mate is when he struts his stuff all around the ring and people are wonderful and, and, and he's awesome, you know, and, and he's thinking, don't worry, I'll just go and beat this lot, you know. And the minute he leaves the paddock, you're so alone, you know. You are totally alone. There's thousands and thousands of people there, but you are alone because he's gone now, you know. And um, that's why I think you are so relieved and, and so uh, emotionally over the top when not only does he come back, but he comes back and he's won, you know. No seven to one second time round. Best mate is massively solid at six to four. As the field gets its act together down at the start, Jim and Valerie are small talking into the big moment. Away they jump for the Tote Cheltenham Gold Cup of 2003 and towards the first of 22 fences. Colonel Braxton in the firing line with Bay Rajan and the great Modulor. And then uh, over on the inside, Seymour Business. As they landed over the first, all safely over before Salmon held up towards the back. The best mate is held up in about eighth or ninth place as they clear the second fence. Marlborough also out the back, passing the stands for the first time. The grey modulor having his moment of glory here, just ahead of Seymour Business. Then Bay Rajan in third. Three lengths, Colonel Braxton with chives in a white sleeve jacket in fifth place wide then. Valley Henry in a red cap. Then best mate from Hazard, Collange and Comanche Court. Harbour Pilot is next first gold and then truckers tavern with Marlborough on the inside B4 salmon held up well off the pace by Timmy Murphy together with Eura Gooden in the rear over the next the first in the back straight and B4 salmon is a faller B4 salmon is down there the novice 
The gamble hasn't paid off. A faller at the third fence, B47. As they now go on towards the water jump, Modulor lands just ahead of Beirajan at the water. So away they go once again then. And on now to fence number 13. And it's Beirajan, whose bright white face showing out in front under Richard Johnson, who won on Looks Like Trouble in 2000. Beirajan down the hill, ahead of Seymour Business and Shy of second and third. Valley Henry is fourth. And then uh, Modulor on the inside, Hazard Collange, best mate creeping just a little bit closer as they take this tricky fence at which first gold made a slight mistake. But uh, they're all reasonably in touch. Euro Gooden with the bat marker would be about 15 to 20 lengths behind this leader. Beirajan taking the water jump. Beirajan overhead from Chives in second place. Plenty in with chances as they go towards another open ditch. Beirajan by a couple of lengths to Chives, drawing towards this one. The leader takes it well. Seymour Business over in third. Valley Henry on the inside. Best mate, the light blue sleeve jacket, moving well under Jim Cullity. Hazard Collange is wide of him over the next plane fence. And at this one, Beirajan got in a bit tight and Chives, best mate, stable companion, right on turn on landing. Chimes, who's a grand national candidate, he could yet be a big Gold Cup candidate as they go towards the ditch again, going uphill on the far side. Chimes and Beirajan clear of Valley Henry. Best mate, Jim Cullity, looking confident in fourth place. Then Seymour Business, who's just feeling the pace now, the old warrior. From Comanche Court, getting a bit closer. And behind these, Hazard Collange is dropping out. Chimes jumps that fence very well at the top of the hill and leads over by two or three lengths. Mistakes by Colonel Braxton towards the back also you're a good one and now they've got four fences left to jump the tricky fence going slightly down here at the top and it's Chives who's kicked five or six lengths clear but now Valley Henry and Best Mate are both getting closer as they take this one and it's Henry and tonight one and two now Chives Best Mate is cantering in second place last year's winner in third is Valley Henry with every chance down the hill and their Best Mate looming up Richard Guest on the near side Jim Cullity he's full of horse as they go down towards three out Chives a big jump in the centre Valley Henry on the right but here's Best mate traveling like the good horse he is and he's going to lead them turning for home back in fourth place is truckers tavern then bay Rajan and comanche court and so 12 months on it's best mate again he turns for home bidding to win his second gold cup the first horse to do so since les gargo in the early 70s and best mate by five or six lengths to valley henry the second last best mate a lovely jump there valley henry clambered through it in second then in third place is Chives. Trucker's Tavern stays on, but closing to the final fence, it's best mate and Jim Cullity. He puts himself right over it. Best mate by a dozen lengths. Trucker's Tavern running a massive race into second place. Then Valley Henry in third. But best mate, this beautiful horse, best mate's going to win back-to-back -back jump and gold cup. He's strolling away with it. A top-class performance. Best mate wins the gold cup. Trucker's Tavern in second, tight for third between Valley Henry and the running on Harbour pilot. Next home Comanche Court from Beirajan and Chives. After these was Seymour Business, the ground was too lively for him. Euro Gooden next, back in the field to Colonel Braxton, Marlborough, then first gold, and Modulor completed the course at a big price. Well, this is the best we've seen for some time. The best chaser, the best staying chaser in the country, and on today's evidence, the best chaser in the country by a very long way. Been trained for this race since 12 months ago. Henrietta Knight picks and chooses the races carefully. He's still got time on his side. He's only an eight-year-old. He can come back in a year's time, and Her Majesty the Queen has seen something special here on her first visit to Cheltenham in half a century. Best mate and Jim Cullity win again. Well, the manner in which he won that race, foot perfect, went uh, with the pace, came round that last bend and just floated like a ballet dancer up the hill, didn't he, you know? And, um, and I'm looking and thinking, well, he is different. My God, he's different, you know? And, um, and that was another wonderful victory, and for Henrietta, a wonderful achievement. And Henrietta's day of days. Gets a hug from Derek Thompson while into every life, a little rain this fall. <laughs> And uh, on her way now, trying to find that man, Terry Middlecombe. And there he is, a crumpled face, 
in a crumpled hat. And that is what it's all about. Amazing scenes and Henrietta, is a, uh, John and I both know her very well. She's a real character, very intelligent woman, but anthropomorphic about her horses. And I mean, she won't have slept for weeks knowing her. She she, she worry about every well every blade of grass it treads over. Well, just the fact that when we showed the clip earlier, they bring this horse in every night during the summer just so that uh, there's no chance of him injuring himself and nobody being able to get to him. But. She said right from the outset that this was a proper champion. I mean, it's a big shout to say that, you know, he's a not... She never actually said he's another Oracle, but she said he's that type. And that was a long way before he won his first Gold Cup. And, well, he might not ever be another Oracle in terms of what he wins, but he's a very special horse. And uh, he'd be a champion, wouldn't matter what he did. This is the weaver of dreams. He counted it. Yeah, and Jim, you know, this is now the public source. They absolutely yeah, love it. Yes. I tell you what, Alice, uh, all day people be coming up to me and I keep saying, say your prayers. No, we will. We said them, all, you know, all that stuff. And they really do like the horse. And uh, it's the so, yes, yeah, he's so fantastic. And the love that Henrietta, you know. They went a right good gallop, I think it was a. Martin Pipe might have had a kind of a 66 to 1 shot in the race and went off, just went a million miles an hour and set it up like a right good gallop and he, and even a right good gallop, he was hard on the bridle all the way around, he was just bang 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 over his fences, it was awesome, awesome feeling and uh, again down the hill they all started getting tired and I didn't want to hit the front too soon but in the end he just carried me there and I just said go on so and you know he won 10 lengths and like could have been if someone was there to take him and race with him, it could have been 30 lengths, you know, it was an unbelievable race that was. This was Best Mate's most imperious Gold Cup, a victory in the manner of the mighty. And making her first visit, apparently much enjoyed, to Cheltenham in 50 years, it was Her Majesty the Queen who presented the trophy to Jim Lewis, owner of the first dual Gold Cup winner, since Lescargo in 1970 and 71. Back at base, home is the hero and bright as a button. Oi! You seen his door? <laughs> in a world drowning in bogus celebrities, Best mate's sporting achievements had transformed him into a genuine star and Henrietta's annual Open Day drew the best part of 10,000 people to see the horse show himself off in the September sun. Not everyone could see him racing, so visiting best mate at home was the next best thing. There really aren't the right races to run him in and we want to preserve him. We feel that as he's done quite well, by only running three times and won two Gold Cups. We don't want to trust our luck any further and change the system that's worked. Life stories are published ridiculously early these days, but few eight-year-olds can claim to have books written about them. And Jim Lewis made the shrewd move of trademarking Best Mate's name and setting up a charity so that money from merchandising could be channeled to deserving causes. Best mate picked up the trail at Huntingdon just hours after the English had squeaked home against the Aussies in the Rugby World Cup final. Well, you couldn't get much better, could you? England winning the World Cup and then coming to watch Best Mate. This is lucky Jim Lewis. Where did you watch the World Cup from or did you watch it or what? Actually, we were, we were travelling down to the, to the races, Derek, and we were in the car listening on the radio. Yeah. And uh, 
and then we finally got here but it was at the absolute crucial time you know we're waiting for the uh, extra time yeah. he said we stay in the car and we do not move until we know the result you yes. know it was fantastic we, sing, we were singing sweet chariot and the, everybody thought yeah. we were mad so what about the double now what about best mate i mean it looks would, superb yeah would that be fantastic yeah. wouldn't it really it would you know yeah we bought our koinor diamond out derek in uh, in pretty lousy weather right eh? oh, no. and uh, so hopefully uh, he won't tarnish his uh, the, the old luster and we'll be able to take him home again but he's in good form and he's as fit as a flea we everybody with a horse would worry about the ground wouldn't they with the going deteriorating with every falling cat and dog those worries were to prove entirely justified it's now getting tough. Jed Akoshe continues to run on strongly and Best Mate coming under pressure in second place and he can't go with the French horse. Valley Henry's back in third and Jed Akoshe full of running at the final fence. He hit it hard. He's just picked up by Jack Riku. Best Mate running out of steam a little bit in second place. Valley Henry's back in third and racing up towards the line. Could this be a new star? It comes from France. Even the best ones get beat. It's an immutable law. But those carping critics endlessly whinging about the rarity with which best mate was pitched into the fight might be surprised to hear the conclusion of the person who knew him better than anyone that he was not in fact the most robust of horses well I think he was quite a fragile horse he was a he was not the strongest constitution after a race in which he always put everything in he used to take a little bit of time to recover. He would always come out of his stable after a race, except for, Chel for that day at Kempton, the first King George. He would always come out walking and trotting as sound as a bell. But he was always quite tired. And uh, he used to take longer to get back his sparkle. The recovery. And the recovery time was quite lengthy with him. And we always knew when Best Mate was right, because he would be so fresh and well at home, and he would be uh, you know on top of the world and and we could definitely tell when he'd had a hard race that he needed time to recover and he was not the sort of horse that you could race in a big race wait a fortnight and go again nobody would have seen him the right best mate then he would have been uh, half the horse he'd have been a, um, a tired horse without the sparkle and the the, uh, the fans and the the public would have been very disappointed in him because we tried to get him spot on for all the big races so he was really ready to give his best and that was the reason for the light campaign he was not a toughie jim lewis's desire for best mate to return to the land of his birth coupled with henrietta's conviction that kempton didn't play to the horse's strengths meant that best mate was diverted from the king george and his last hurrah before a third gold cup attempt was at leopardstown's christmas meeting in the Ericsson Chase. Well, I think um, Jim Lewis had wanted always to take Best Mate to Ireland, to the country he was born in, and, and for the Irish to really appreciate him. And uh, it seemed a better track for him than Kempton. It was left-handed, it was galloping, and lovely big fences. And the race, provided the ground had not been too heavy, was going to be the ideal race for him. He was an Irish bred horse and, and, and the Irish loved him. And so we thought we, it, a sort of an allegiance really to go. You know. Leopardstown's a fabulous race course and, uh, and the ground seemed as though it would be okay. Henrietta always thought that Kempton was too tight for him. He won the King George because he was a good horse, but she always, she always felt it was tight for him, you know. So we had this mad brained idea well, we'll send Ed to Don Bleu then, the, the so-called super sub, and, and best mate will go to Leperstown, you see. And so it was to be. Uh, he's having only his fifth run since his first Gold Cup win. Teddy looks well. He looks absolutely magnificent. He must have uh, blankets from the back of his ears to the top of his tail because he has a coat on him. Even that half clip on him is like a summer coat. He looks absolutely magnificent. He's a credit to everybody in uh, Hen's outfit. But uh, he looks, he's a gorgeous looking horse as well too. Seldom do you see such a nice horse as uh, such a good race horse. Usually they're pretty horses, they're show horses, but they don't turn out to be race horses. But this horse is an absolute oil painting to look at him. Beautiful head in him, gorgeous big horse, good front leg on him, well tied top, great backside, good hind leg on him, everything you'd like in a real nice horse, and then he's a, a star into boot. 
Seldom you get that in Manor Beast. And out in front, best mate tracks him, or just over a length of drift, two lengths back to B for Salmon, followed by Le Coudre and Al Capone running a good race in fifth, but over the fourth last fence, B for Salmon got it wrong there, and Le Coudre comes away in third place, but up front it's still Colonel Braxton, best mate with Jim Cullity yet to move in second. B for Salmon recovering the lost ground now on the inside of Le Coudre as they come down to the third last fence, the final open ditch. Colonel Braxton, best mate within a length, Le Coudre and for Salmon just behind and they're clear of Al Capone as they race now off the back straight. They've two fences left to jump in the Ericsson. Colonel Braxton, best mate, poised in second. Le Coudre, a big run in third and for Salmon on the inside. They're clear of Al Capone as they come to the second last. Colonel Braxton, the leader from best mate in second. Then Le Coudre and for Salmon just behind him and they're well clear of Al Capone as they race towards the turn. The gap comes on the inside and through it goes, best mate to lead from Colonel Braxton Le Coudre. B for Salmon around the outside in fourth. As they race towards the final fence, best mate the favourite is out in front from Colonel Braxton. Le Coudre on the near side. B for Salmon trying hard to get into contention, but as they come to the last, best mate is out in front from Le Coudre in second. B for Salmon and Colonel Braxton, best mate over the last. Big cheer from the crowd. Le Coudre is running a big one in second. B for Salmon in third and fourth place is Colonel Braxton and racing into the closing stages in the Ericsson. It's best mate, the champion, and looking every inch that as they race to the line. Jim Colliday looks over both shoulders. Best mate wins the Ericsson and wins it well. Le Coudre, a big run for second. B for Salmon is third, cleared of Colonel Braxton. Al Capone is next and Alexander Banquet is the last to finish. So, best mate, the dual... Cheltenham Gold Cup winner has come and conquered Leopardstown. The welcome he got in that country, I mean the reception he got after winning that race, it was as good as the Gold Cup. The Irish were really thrilled to see him. He believed, they believed he was their horse and they bred him and they'd seen a true champion. one of the television stations did a film of him throughout the whole race just from fence to fence to fence just the camera on him and I watched it somebody showed it to me afterwards and I thought God you know that is impressive like he just met every fence bang 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 pressed the button away he went you know um, that was that was an awesome performance but just watch this horse he's absolutely he's only in I mean if you're driving a good car and you have the overdrive this horse has never even slipped into the overdrive he's slipping along there in sort of fourth gear Jim is happy as Larry and I'm letting him pop away he's never made a size mistake and how well he's really going is he comes up on his hands at a few fences he's only strolling along it's just a, a stroll in the park from here today uh, Le Coudre has run a great race to be second a cracker B for Salmon to his credit has run well to be third after being under pressure from a long ways out but just look at the horse in front stands out of the last ditch there, Jim peeps over his shoulder, left and right, he's letting Tony McCoy there on Colonel Braxton who's going to road race on sufferance, but it's just a matter of when I want to let this horse go and he switches to the inside of Tony McCoy down to second last, jumps it well again he's been foot perfect all the way no flaws in this horse's armour he quickens up, he's got speed he jumps, he stays, and those fellas who had 70,000 uh, to win 60 had nothing to worry about every step of the way look at him at the last again, sails over it, and won 9 or 10 links it could have been 25. Hell of a horse. He deserves everything he gets. That's all. Terrific racing occasion. I was in Leopardstown and there was a t fantastic atmosphere. And to see him go out and give an absolutely flawless display of racing and jumping was really a highlight of, of, of a lot of the races I've seen. And I think the Irish crowd took him really to their hearts that day. He was one of their own after that. Best mate had been back to the country that produced him and taken the place by storm. At Henrietta's, it was now all about two and a half months of fine tuning. All polo needs. We should have an investment. We should have a shares in polos. For Jim, the enormity of the expectations surrounding their tilt at a third Gold Cup was unremitting. Everyone felt it. 
the, the pressure was enormous. And, and I think the, what, what uh, made the pressure greater was the fact that you suddenly realised that, that the press and the media and all his fans and the people that didn't even know Best Mate was a racehorse until that year, they all wanted him to win for the good of racing, they said, for the, for the spectacle, they said, you know. And, um, and you start thinking, well, surely it don't matter. It doesn't matter if he doesn't win a third goal. It would be wonderful if he does. But, you know, they all wanted him to win, you know. Every media outlet in the islands wanted a part of Best Mate in the Gold Cup build-up. And Channel 4 sent down the brightest and arguably the most brilliant jockey of them all. Just walking along, he carries himself well. He's got a really light mouth. I thought that uh, looks like trouble of being the best horse I'd sat on, even though I'd never ridden him in a race. This horse gives you exactly the same feel. Slightly, not quite as tall as looks like trouble, slightly more compact, probably just a little bit wider, but you know, he's just a proper horse, could do anything. For all hens jollity, there is a deep grain toughness to her. But never before had the focus on Best Mate been so ferocious, and even she felt the ever-increasing strain. There were times when I very nearly cracked. Um, we had 70 horses to train in the yard. Everybody wanted to know about Best Mate. I uh, didn't want to neglect my everyday duties. And yet, the press wanted to come over people wanted to come over, everybody was ringing us up, and we never turned anybody away. And, you know, then everything was in the newspapers, everything was... It was a fairly frantic and a stressful time. But, uh, you know, we had to keep everything as calm as we could, and we had to make sure that we had our horse unaffected by it all. Months of preparation go into the moment best mate walks into the paddock, and it's much the same with Henrietta. Well, each year Terry and I like to wear the same clothes. And um, first of all, I have to wear this suit, this, uh, this special blue suit, which hangs in the cupboard. You can see it's gone rather limp since last year. It's going to need a bit of a freshen up before the Gold Cup this year. That's been in the cupboard ever since last March. With it will come out this shirt in the Aston Villa colours of blue and red, so I'm told. And accompanied by that, this uh, red jersey that goes with it, to keep you warm. So I got the blue and red twice. That has to be best mate's colours. Then I have to keep the hair under control, so we have the black hat that will match my black boots, but something my mother wouldn't have approved of. We have a navy blue bag. The last thing best mate's connections wanted was rain and softening ground. Jim Cullity's morning did not get off to a fly. The day of his third Gold Cup, I had to do the um, morning line for Channel 4 from Cheltenham Racecourse and I had to be there at 8 o'clock in the morning or something. So I was driving there and it was drizzling a bit and you know, I, I, I was looking up at the sky and I was thinking, you know, it's going to clear up, we'll be alright. Um, I was inside doing the morning line, talking about today's racing and all this and I kept looking out the window and I thought, it's pouring, it's pouring rain and the, sc the sky is black. Um, and I thought our chances are <laughs> like going out the window. Um, so the ground had gone softer than ideal, which of course would suit some of the opposition, which was, you know, it's always the danger is that what doesn't suit you often suits the opposition. So, you know, you're getting the two knives in the back. And for once, the ground even had Terry Biddlecombe rattled. Definitely worried Terry now on this particular occasion, mm -hmm. because for the first time ever, he asked me to come out and have a look at the course. And uh, he'd, he'd never done that in the previous two I'd only walked the track. Terry had walked it, but I'd never made any habits of walking the course. And Terry said, I want you to come and have a look here, because this is where I think we should go. Well, we and, don't usually let the inner around there. And so we walked right out, and we looked at this strip of grass that had been, uh, was fresh grass, and uh, hadn't been used in the... Three yards wide. It was very, very narrow, but um, Terry says, I think that Matey has got to go here on this occasion. So, and I want, you to, I want you to see, I want you to see 
what I'm going to tell Jim, and this is where he's going to have to go. So that was that showed that, he, that it was getting to him a bit, because he was worried. Cheltenham bulged that afternoon, with every viewing point taken well before start time. Triple Gold Cup winners are once-in-a-generation rarities. The crowd had come to see if theirs was such an age. The centre of attention had gone off at 7-1 and 6-4 for his first two Gold Cups. But this time, the faithful went in heads down, levering him in to 5-4 on. Not a blade of grass to be seen on the famous Cheltenham lawn as a sea of expectant faces strain their eyes to screen and start. And away they go then for the 2004 Tote Sport Cheltenham Gold Cup. And first gold is the first to go on from Harbour Pilot in the red jacket and Irish Hazar on the outside. Keen leader follows these as they cross the first fence. Best mate landing in about fifth place on the outside of Sir Rembrandt. It is now they approach a, a jumping test. This is an open ditch. First gold is the first to land there. Back in the field, Sir Rembrandt, Truckers Tavern, B4 Salmon, and Alexander Banquet is at the back. Heading towards the next now. They jump 22 in all. And first gold is safely over that one. That was the sixth. They now approach a left-hand turn going slightly uphill. And it's first goal by three or four lengths to Harbour Pilot. Irish Azar and Mick Fitzgerald in third place as they clear this next one. An open ditch, best mate, very close there with Keen Leader just preceding him. Irish Azar just drops back to fifth and a shake of the reins from Mick Fitzgerald. The real bandit and then a gap to Truckers Tavern and Sir Ian Branton B47 and Alexander Banquet. Thierry Dumen really asked for a big jump from first goal and the French horse delivered in tremendous style as they reached the top of the hill. And first goal by four lengths to Harbour Pilot drawing towards it. Irish Hazar is over next. First goal is jumping for fun in the lead. Best mate along the inside. Then Keen leader. They're bunching up a little bit behind the front pair. The real bandit is patiently ridden by Tony McCoy. They jump the next first goal again. Really stood off it there. An exhibition round from him so far. B4 Salmon is ridden very quietly towards the back by Timmy Murphy. He'll be looking to make ground on this final circuit. Truckers Tavern just behind him. Sir Rembrandt just ahead of him and Alexander Banquet continues at the rear. They've got six fences left to jump from here and it's first gold by four lengths to Harbour Pilot. Best mate seems well poised on the inside. Harbour Pilot just jumping slightly across him there. So Rembrandt has improved in the red and yellow jacket. Goes third now. Out wide is Keen Leader, then the real bandit and B4 Salmon. This is another plain fence. First gold. Uh, there a mistake by Sir Rembrandt on the outside in uh, a disputing second place of Harbour Pilot. Best mate in fourth under Jim Cullity. He's got about six lengths to make up on the French horse who continues to lead as they return to this tricky fence. It's four out and it's first goal that comes in to take it. This time he didn't take it quite so well. Harbour Pilot in second. Best mate and Sir Rembrandt on their heels as they start down the hill with three fences left to jump. It's first goal. Best mate on the right there. If with every chance, Harbour Pilot, Sir Rembrandt out wider. Here's three out. First goal from best mate up the inner. Then Harbour Pilot to Rembrandt there, clear of B4 Salmon and the real bandit. They race towards the final turn, first gold, and beef, beef, best mate being held in there by Harbour Pilot. Didn't get a good run as they race for the turn. So Rembrandt takes off out wide. They've got two fences left to jump. First gold is joined by Harbour Pilot. Best mate has got to get out of trouble and now pulls wide at the front pair. Then Sir Rembrandt wider out. B4 Salmon is fifth. At the second last, best mate, great jump, and there he takes it off. Sprinting up the hill, but way too late. Then Alexander Banquet. Well, he's done it, he's done it. 
and Cheltenham is alive with the applause for this great horse, this brilliant horse, best mate, who has lived up to all the hopes, the anticipation, the giant burden of expectation on Jim Cullity here, and won his third Gold Cup. Arkell did it three times in the mid-60s. It wasn't easy, was it? There was a nasty moment on the turn-in. He was held in by Harbour Pilot. He got snatched up for just half a stride, but he jumped to the front at the last. The hallmark of this horse's career has been his clean jumping. He needed a good jump at the last. And then, when he needed some courage on the run-in, he wasn't found wanting. Best mate wins his third Cheltenham Gold Cup. seeing Henrietta and Terry describe the feeling from the back of the horse. To be honest, we walked the track beforehand and we said the only place to be is down the inner. Because down the middle is very cut up for the last race here. It was last year but there was no grass in it. So it was much better on the inner so we had to take the gamble and at times I wasn't getting the best to run but what we'd lose by doing that we gained in the fact we were on the best of the ground, you know. There was no quarter given turning into home straight. No, exactly, like, it's a goal. That's what everybody's saying it's a steering job. It's a goal cup, there is no quarter given, you know. And I was so relieved, it was, I was almost numbed by it. It was, uh, it was such a relief. I, mean, I just couldn't, couldn't believe that we'd got through it and he'd won the three. And then going up that walkway in front of the stands to meet him, and the cheers uh, and the crowds and, the, and everybody, stretching out their arms, wanting to shake hands and touch us and, and, and want to touch best mate when he came back down. Uh, it was some feeling. I mean, it was just absolutely as though you were in another world. For sheer character, this was best mate's finest hour because he had to retrieve a cause that for a fraction of a moment looked lost. A year before, he'd been able to pose. This time, he had to fight. It kind of started with a, at the top of the hill, Andrew Thornton wouldn't let me out, and then what everybody saw on television was Paul Carberry kept me in then at the end, or kind of after the third last. People say, God, he's in the kept you in, number one. He should have. I've done the same to him. That is race riding. You're there to win, and that means kind of, that means beating the opposition, and, you know, there's no quarter given on a race course. Um, but people kind of were panicking, you know, I've watched videos of, that, of it afterwards and the commentator was panicking and all that, but what they forget is you're kind of three furlongs from home there with a stiff uphill finish, so it's like half a mile from home, you could say. So, you know, it wasn't really a panic station, so I tried to get out, couldn't get out, sat and bided my time until, <clears throat> until they went on, which they were going, it was always going to happen, and then got a slot, came out and... That's when best mate showed how good he was, you know, as soon as he pressed the button he went down and winged the second last, landed running and he just took four or five lengths out of the rest of it in, in the space of 20 strides, you know, it was awesome, that just goes to show how much he had in the tank, in the tank you know. We actually saw a different best mate, didn't we? We saw a best mate who was a street fighter, as I referred to. He had guts and he had the one thing that, that some horses haven't got and that is the will to win in spite of any adversity, you know. And if you watch that race carefully, you will see that when he got boxed in and he's running now fourth and now someone's going to ask him to come out of there, jump two fences and get up that hill, I know a lot of horses that wouldn't have done it. And, uh, and to me, that was a measure of another reason why he was different. He had guts, determination, and Jim had the confidence to stick him there and chuck him over those fences. I mean, the second last, the acceleration and, and, and the leap was just for the gods, eh?
The way best mate is remembered should have nothing to do with sentiment. Jumping is always hard and occasionally brutal. And that is why climbing the Gold Cup peak three times means this horse is the subject of respect, affection and plain old gratitude. I think that uh, as a horse he was everything you could ask for. He had beauty, he had brains for want of a better word. Uh, everything he did in life was to please the people around him. And I think that for the people who watched him and the people who knew him, he brought a little bit of joy to everybody. Those people asked me, what was he like, kind of thing, and you know, he was, my answer to that was nearly always like, if you wanted a best friend, you'd want best mate, because he was ultra reliable, didn't have a bad bone in his body, he was clever, he was intelligent, he had all the attributes of what you'd want, but dependable. He was never out of the first two in his life, you know. That was, that was, that's just him, dependable. I think his strength, the beauty of the horse, and um, how he presented himself to the public, and what he'd done. I mean, you can't get better than that. Yes, they should remember him for those wonderful victories at Cheltenham, for the way he always used to walk around the paddock with his head up and say, look at me. Um, he was uh, pure, pure class always, pure class, and he was such a beautiful horse. He was perfection in the thoroughbred. And uh, the way he walked, it's difficult to think of a horse ever walking like he walked. He just walked on air, and he had that look of eagles. He had a love affair with the public, didn't he? And they loved him, and he loved them. And to have owned a horse like that was already something special. But he was different. He was different because he, he did things that other horses haven't done. He was different because he was raising money for charity. And he's different because he had this air about him that people will never forget. And, and I think that the style and the grace that he had will live in our memory forever. And, and uh, my father once said to me, of all the things you may wish for yourself in this life, make sure that one of them you wish for is luck. Best mate, how lucky can one be in one lifetime?